All right, this is Josiah. I just wanted to talk a little bit about allergic rhinitis. Um, and let's get going on this. So what is the symptoms of allergic rhinitis? So typical symptoms include sneezing, rhinorrhea, which is the dripping of the nose, uh, tearing watery eyes. In a lot of patients, if you look over here at the picture on the bottom where the cursor is, they'll get some nasal obstruction, and this is called a polyp, which is an overgrowth of the turbinate in the nose, which can actually cause a feeling of fullness and obstruction. Um, itchy eyes, nose, soft palate, and ears is very common. It's actually one of the symptoms that helps you diagnose this versus a common cold. Um, it does cause a cough as the post-nasal drip will irritate the back of the throat and fatigue. And in children, they'll do what's called a little click where they're actually itching the upper part of the soft palate. And um, so they'll be kind of like snorting and clicking. And the reason is for this is kids don't like to blow their nose that much. Um, if you look at the picture over here on the right of this, this child, he has a couple things that help diagnose this in kids. And if you see this nasal crease here, they'll develop a little crease here from constantly rubbing their drip off their nose. And it's one of the signs in children. It's also called the salute sign of uh, um, allergic rhinitis. The signers, the developing under the eyes is actually dilated blood vessels. And uh, we'll move on to the next slide. So a little bit of information here. If you look over here at the cursor, so what we have with allergic rhinitis is we have an IgE antibody that has developed through first sensitization. And these uh, IgE went down to the antigen from the environment, breathed into the nose or uh, the upper respiratory tract, will bind to this IgE, which, will, which is located on the mast cell, which causes the mast cell to essentially degranulate and release histamine. And we know that histamine causes dilation of blood vessels to bring in the immune system and also stimulates the nerves in the area. So the vasodilation is we get that swelling and the mucus, that drip in the nose, the back of the throat, the dilation around under the eyes. And the stimulation of the nerves by the histamine causes the reflexic sneezing in a sense, it's the body trying to push out what environmental allergen is in, in the nose or the respiratory tract, trying to get rid of it. It has been found that people with, that have severe allergies tend to have more mast cells in their system. Some studies show up to 50 times more than somebody without allergies. And then the other thing that we know is as you're continually exposed to the allergen, your threshold for having the allergic symptoms is actually reduced. It takes a few years to develop sensitivity, so it's very uncommon to see it in children under two as it takes a few years to develop this. So a couple things that you'll see with alert people that suffer from allergic rhinitis is we'll get some of that watery red conjunctiva um, a lot of people I've seen that suffer from aller allergies also have uh, allergic uh, eczema on their skin. About 50% have, have that, runs in families. Uh, there's a history of asthma in the family or they actually do have asthma. So a couple of things that we need to be aware of when you're trying to diagnose allergic rhinitis in the family practice is, is this sinusitis bacterial or viral sinusitis from actually congestion from allergies. And you can kind of see in the picture here some of the sinuses getting clogged with uh, bacteria. And the symptoms tend to be a little different from that. You're not going to get the sneezing, um, the rhinorrhea. They'll have a lot of pressure in their sinuses, like bending forward will be pretty painful in the sinuses. Um, usually the sinus pressure is there about 10 days before I typically will pull the trigger on an antibiotic as it's probably viral leading up to that point. And if it continues, obviously you're dealing with more of a bacterial issue. Um, 
In some people, the, uh, the allergies are so bad, they'll develop uh, an asthma, and you can kind of see in this picture on the left here, uh, which is essentially an airway uh, allergy uh, problem, and it constricts the bronchioles, restricting flow of oxygen and air, uh, carbon dioxide exchange at the alveoli. So some things that we know about allergic rhinitis is some people have sensitivity to dust mites. And as you see these little pictures, these are, are microscopic. They're, you can't see them. They live on a lot of surfaces that have a lot of texture. So bedding, pillows, stuffed animals are a huge problem in children that have allergic rhinitis. Carpets, blinds, and so in order to help reduce the problem with that, we need, you need to dust and wash the bedding, the stuffed animals, the room, the drapes, if you have them often. Some people will have problems with cockroaches, which is interesting relationship between developing an allergen from any part of the cockroach's body, their feces. Um, so it's really important to deal with if you have a cockroach problem in the house. Um, talking about that with your patient. Um, a lot of people have problems with trees and grasses. And if you see this, I got this from up to date here, uh, peak pollen periods in the United States. I live in the Southwest, so you can kind of see the grasses and weeds tend to be a problem in the summertime, in the trees in the spring, which kind of makes sense. Everything blooms and, and gets going. So the diagnosis for allergic rhinitis is almost always purely clinical, meaning you don't need to draw labs. There's not a lot of testing unless you're having, you're running into a roadblocks with treatment. At that point, a referral to an allergen specialist for skin prick testing, uh, some blood work, looking at the IgE levels would be appropriate. But in family practice, most of the time, you're going to diagnosis by clinical exam, like we had talked about. Uh, the sneezing, the itching, the, the runny nose, the itching in the palate, even the ears, um, the, shine, the shiners under the eyes, and the salute sign on children is very common. I typically will always examine the ears, the eyes, the nose, and the back of the throat very thoroughly with anybody that's having upper respiratory symptoms. And the polyps in adults is usually can be found in, and I would say about 50% of the cases of a chronic allergen issue. Um, and that's pretty easy to diagnose just by looking up the nose uh, with the light there. So what do we do about this? Um, so there's a couple things you can do. There are steroids, intranasal steroids, which you inhale, and those are good for blocking the immune reaction. Um, also, second-generation antihistamines are effective because they don't cross the blood-brain barrier like Benadryl does, so it typically is less sedating, and those are effective. And then uh, something I recommend to almost all my patients that deal with this is actually using sterile uh, saline and flushing the nose, as you can see here in this right picture with this child, actually trying to flush out some of the environment that's causing that sensitivity to the allergen and that helps reduce the load in the upper respiratory tract. If we're still having problems, sometimes I will prescribe a combination of a steroid with an intranasal uh, antihistamine, as you can see up in the top picture here, the azelestine and the fluticasone combo for intranasal injection. And then obviously like we talked about the dust mite removal, um, washing bedding and things like that. I wanted to talk about real briefly something I have seen quite often and it's people with, that suffer from allergies and purchase over the counter nasal spray. Oxymetazoline is a, a, a big uh, ingredient in a lot of these over the counter uh, decongestant sprays. Some people, after repeated use of days of using this, once the medication wears off, all their symptoms come back and worse. The congestion, the pressure can come back, and they're find, they find out that they're unable to stop using these sprays, and they're using them more often. Uh, I've had patients coming in 
that went from using this a couple of days, a times a day to six, seven times a day because it works temporarily, but they get this massive rebound congestion in the nose. And it can be very difficult to help people get off of this. Um, the things that I have done are, I will try to start with Flonase, the steroid, to see if I can reduce the allergen, and then tell them essentially to try to wean down on this to nothing over a period of a few days. Um, I've had people fail that, come back, and I'll add that nasal antihistamine with the fluticasone, as we saw on the previous slide, the, and try that. And then I've had people come back after that, unable to get off, and I've actually had to prescribe a short burst medrol dose pack or prednisone for a few days just to give them that crossover so that they can stop the nasal spray. Now, I don't always recommend uh, oral glucocorticoids because there's a lot of side effects, including uh, blood sugar issues. Some people, it, it affects the brain. Um, so you have to be very careful with that. And I usually kind of keep that in the back of my, my mind of something that we can do, but be very cautious with prescribing steroids for, um, for the rebound rhinitis from the things like Afrin and oxymetazoline and um, technically the medical diagnosis is rhinitis medicamentosa. Basically, they've become addicted to the spray and their bodies have adjusted. Thank you very much.